There's seven places where God pronounces blessings upon His church, upon His people. And, and seven, by the way, going forward is, is going to be an important and significant number in, in this book. Here we have seven letters to seven churches. We'll see seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, seven stars, seven lampstands, and, and even more. Uh, and of course, the number seven is the number that represents the nature of God. It, it signifies fullness and completeness, signifies perfection. That's how you change the world. Thank you for listening to Change the World with Pastor Vic Carroll from Calvary Somerville. It is our hope that this message will help you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, with today's message, here's Pastor Vic. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do just that this morning. We shout in our hearts, Lord, for joy. Joy, Father, of, of what you have done for us on the cross. We are joyful of, of the revelation of your word. And as we come to your word this morning, Lord, as we come before you, we pray now, God, that you would speak to us today. That your word, Father, would fall on fertile ground. That we may thirst for you and thirst for your word as the deer pants for the water. God, speak to us now. May the Holy Spirit move about this room as we open up your word, open up our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We just completed the, the Gospel of Mark. And the Gospels are a culmination of Jesus completing the mission of His first coming. Coming in humility. Coming in the form of a man. Coming, uh, as He said, not to be served, but to serve. Coming as a humble king, ultimately to be crucified, to die on the cross for the sins of all mankind. But now, I'm very excited to move into uh, the book of Revelation. If you could turn in your Bibles to the first chapter of the book of Revelation. The word Revelation comes from the ancient Greek word apocalypsis, which is where we obviously get our word apocalypse. And most people today equate the word apocalypse with chaos and catastrophe, but that's not what it means at all. It actually just means to uncover. It's a revealing. It's an unveiling. Much like a, a, a sculptor would, would pull away the, the veil to reveal his art, his work, or the curtains of a stage would be drawn uh, just before the play begins. The, the, the book of Revelation is just that. It is a revealing. And though we're going to be told of the Antichrist, this book is going to show us God's judgment upon a sinful world. We're going to be told of, of calamity on the earth like has never been before. We're going to be shown a mystery Babylon in great details. We're going to see you and I. We're going to see God's plan and purpose for the church as it relates to end times. And, and though all of this stuff is going to be uh, fascinating, what I want you to get, what I want you to understand is all of these things are not the main purpose of this book. The, the revelation, what the writer uh, of this book wants to reveal to us, the main thing uh, it, it is is one thing. People like to call this book Revelations. Look in your Bible. There's no S at the end of the word. It's Revelation. There's one uh, revelation. There's one reveal. And that revelation is Jesus Christ. Not the humble king that we read about in Mark's gospel. That mission has been fulfilled in His first coming. But the revelation that's going to be revealed in the book of Revelation is Jesus Christ coming as the conquering, victorious King. The theme of this book is the reveal of Christ in all His majesty, in all His splendor, in all His glory, 
in all his godhood. And if you get everything else, all the prophecies and stuff, if you get all of that in this book, but you miss the main purpose, then you've missed the whole book entirely. The reveal of the glory of our God, Jesus Christ. Now, most Christians won't even touch the book of Revelation. They won't read it because they think it's too difficult. Many churches, many pastors outside of Calvary Chapel, they won't teach it in regards to uh, verse by verse. But if God wrote it, God meant for us to read it. And what I want you to know today is that God not only meant for us to read it, he means for us to understand it. God is not the author of confusion. And so why do most people have such a problem or have such a hard time comprehending the book of Revelation? In my opinion, the biggest obstacle in understanding this book and something that's far too common among Christians is the lack of desire or a lack of a good understanding of the Old Testament. The, the, the attitude within Christendom today is that the Old Testament is not as important or it's not as uh, relevant to us, the church, as the new. And, and that's a lie from the pit of hell. Because Jesus Christ is all over the Old Testament from Genesis to, to Malachi. In fact, the purpose of the Old Testament, the purpose of the Old Testament was to point mankind to Jesus Christ, to point man to the cross. And so it's no wonder that Revelation is not being taught, that, that Christians aren't reading it. No one can understand it because they lack the understanding of the law and the prophets. Because four of the 404 verses in the book of Revelation, 278 of those verses are clear, direct references to the Old Testament. And so there needs to be that, that foundation, that knowledge of the writings of the law and, and the prophets in order to establish and to develop a, a good grasp of what's being written about in this book. And then the other verses in Revelation that aren't referencing the Old Testament, many times we're going to find that God declares to us what is happening. He, he defines the symbolic language that he is using as the events occur. And so, though it's a difficult book, it absolutely is. It's, it's much easier to grasp if you and I have a, a, a basic knowledge of the rest of scripture particularly the old testament that's what drew me to calvary chapel 16 years ago going through the bible verse by verse from genesis to revelation understanding the importance of of developing the knowledge of scripture in its totality everything in the proper context that's what gives me the ability as the reader to to fully absorb and to comprehend the Word. And what is the Word? What's going to be revealed to us in the book of Revelation? The Word is Jesus Christ. And how we as a church, we as a nation, the world, we need, to, we need Jesus to be revealed in a big way. like Spurgeon says that, that, that he wouldn't be just a character on a page, that he, that he wouldn't be just some historical figure, but that he would, he would be seen by the world as a, a, a present, living, bright reality. And I believe that that is the purpose, that is the intention of this book of Revelation. And we begin here in chapter 1, Verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, Jesus, why? To show his servants. It's, 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 it's interesting that, that Jesus 
now we're being told that Jesus is not only the object of what is being revealed, but we see here that he is the one doing the revealing. Jesus revealing himself, his, his majesty, his deity, revealing to his servants, it says, things which must shortly take place. And so there's the implication here of predictive prophecy. Not all prophecy is predictive, but, but we're, we're told that what is going to be described in this book is future events that not only will take place, but it says must take place, and it says must take place shortly. Now, uh, what, what's important for, for us to understand when it uses the word shortly is that God doesn't operate on man's timetable. And so a thousand years is as a day unto the Lord. But, but uh, also this word shortly, if we look, uh, it comes from the Greek phrase in tachai, which, which uh, literally means uh, something that happens quickly or something that suddenly comes to pass. Uh, indicating rapidity of execution once it begins. By using the word shortly, the idea is not that the event would occur soon, but, uh, you know, as it relates to, to, to men, but that when it does occur, it will be sudden. Uh, I think the proper way to view this is not to see uh, these events that are going to be described in this book, not to see these events as as uh, something that is far off in the future as it relates to time, even 2,000 years ago when it was written. The proper way to view this is that for 2,000 years, history, man has been on the brink of the end. And I believe that the only thing holding God back from wrapping this whole thing up today is God's indescribable grace. Grace. <laughs> he's waiting for that one person, that one last person. He's got a number and that one last person he's got in mind for that person to come to a saving grace. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. Servants is that word doulos. Uh, you remember that from the, the, the book of Acts. It speaks of believers, but it speaks of believers uh, from a, a, a deeper, more intimate context. It's, it's a slave, but it's a person who has become a slave not by force, but by choice. And there are two kinds of people in the world, and there are two kinds of people in the church. There are people who serve, and there are people who seek to be served. And so this revelation, the Lord is telling us right here, this book, this is being revealed, it's being given to those who are servants of the Lord, those who are paying a price, paying a price for their faithfulness unto Jesus Christ. Those who sacrifice their time, their money, their talents to show his servants, what he says here, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified which is the, the Greek word literally means to show by a sign. So he sent and signified. He's sending this message. People think, why does God speak uh, it with signs? Why does he just tell us like it is? Well, think about this. This is written 2,000 years ago. And a person that's being revealed, you know, 2,000 years in the future, how does someone from 2,000 years ago explain nuclear warfare? Or how do they explain even a tank? You know, so God speaks to us in signs. But we, his people, we, the church, we can decipher. We can, we can uh, understand what he's saying here. He sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. This is the, the, the John who referred to himself as the disciple who Jesus loved, the only disciple to witness Jesus' death on the cross. You remember Jesus from the cross. 
he, he looked at, at John and he commissioned John to take care of his mother. And John did. John also went on to write the, the three epistles, first and second and third John. Uh, he wrote the, the gospel of John, the love gospel, which is the first book that we studied here as a church at Calvary Chapel, Somerville. And I've, I've heard it said that there are three things that a new believer should do. When a person comes to a saving faith uh, in, in Jesus Christ, there are three things that we should instruct that person to do. The first thing that they should do is read the Gospel of John in its entirety. The second thing they should do is read the Gospel of John in its entirety. And then you can guess the third thing that they should do is read the Gospel of John. The love gospel. And this is the same John here that's being directed by the Lord that's now authoring the book of Revelation. But he's now, uh, he's now at the end of his life. He, he is the last surviving member of the original disciples. It's been 60 some odd years we're, we're since Jesus' uh, ascension. And we're, we're at the end of the first century. We're around uh, 95 A.D. And uh, along... Uh, this time, the Roman emperor, his name was Domitian, he has launched a, a, a full-out uh, assault upon the, the Christian community. I mean, worldwide. And this guy was, was brutal. And so John, because of his faith, has been exiled to this island called Patmos. And that's where he's going to be given these visions and, and, and these signs that he's going to be asked to, to write down uh, uh, of, the, of the end times. It says, His servant John, verse 2, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. So John obviously was a disciple. He, he was a witness to all that Jesus did. And if we skip down to verse 19, uh, the, the angel asked John to write down the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things uh, which will take place after this. And don't think that we're skipping ahead and that we're almost done because we're not. But he says, write down the past, the present, and the future. Things that will uh, take place after this. And we're going to see when we get to chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 1, these things that take place after this is, is where that begins. In chapter 4 and in verse 3, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. Now, this is an important section of, of Scripture right here. If you don't get anything else today, I want, you to, I want you to get this. We are given here a particular and a unique opportunity to be blessed by God simply by reading and keeping the word of this book. And those who, who neglect it, they're just cheating themselves out of a blessing. The Anglican Church virtually omits revelation in its regular schedule of, of readings, both publicly and in private devotions. The, again, the, the typical attitude among Christians is, is that only fanatics would uh, want to dig deep into this book. But, but really, as we're told here by John, it's a book for everyone. It's a book for anyone who wants to be blessed by God. Now, let's point out here that fortunately that John didn't say that we have to understand every little thing in this book to be blessed by it. L living, living uh, and, and, and again, what I believe are the last days, you and I have the luxury of, on looking back at uh, prophecy as it has been uh, fulfilled. And that helps us to understand these words. But think if you lived a thousand years ago, or even just a hundred years ago, when much of end times prophecy had not been fulfilled. In, in, in fact, a lot of uh, the prophetic writings of Scripture deal with the nation of Israel. Israel is God's clock if you will. But from A.D. 70 until 1948, from 1900 years, there was no clock. 
So how is anybody going to tell what time it is? We don't, even, we don't even have a clock because Israel didn't exist as a nation for nearly 1,900 years. But when the Jews returned to their homeland, and on May 14, 1948, when Israel was once again recognized as its own sovereign nation, then the prophetic writings of Scripture, as it relates to end times, began to become more and more unambiguous. Things started to, to, to make sense. It's like a big uh, veil was lifted. A veil was lifted in regards to comprehending what's written about the end of time. And in my opinion, I think it's safe to say that on May 14th, 1948, the end began. And it's winding down. But even today, uh, we're going to go through this book and there are going to be some things in it that are, are still a mystery to us. But uh, again, as as as... You know, more and more will be revealed as the clock continues to, to wind down. But the point is that I'm making is that we can be blessed by reading uh, and, and by hearing and obeying even when we don't uh, completely understand. Also, another thing that I found interesting is the, the phrase, he who reads is singular uh, and, and the verb read in the original language, means to, to read out loud, to, to read aloud. Uh, but the phrase, those who hear, is plural. And so it promotes the, the church setting. It confirms Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25, that says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as in the manner of some. Some don't do it. We should not forsake uh, gathering together of the saints, but exhorting one another, and then look at this, and so much the more as you see the day, the end times, so much more as you see the day approaching. People like to think, well, I don't need a church. I can just have church at home. I can read my Bible. No, no. The, the, the writer of Hebrews, as is John, they're stressing how important it is for us to come to church, for us to gather as a body consistently. And, and John says, especially in these days, these last days that you and I are living in. And in our vernacular here, John is saying, blessed is the pastor who reads and teaches and keeps revelation." And then he says, and blessed as well is the congregation who hears it, who receives it, and keeps it as well. And so I don't want to cheat myself or you out of a blessing. And so, but, 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 but revelation, what we need to understand is it gives us much more than just prophetic information. It, it, it gives us things to keep. Hearing absorbing, keeping the words of this book are life-altering. It was a very tumultuous time when it was written because of the persecution of the, the Roman emperor. And so for them, for us, as this book is being read, it is meant to exhort. It is meant to encourage believers. But what you need to understand is it is also a book that should cause you to examine your life and to determine areas that need to be corrected. And the Lord here through John is going to do just that. He's going to point out some areas within these particular churches that need to be addressed. Verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. And so we see uh, this book was initially addressed to seven specific churches in Asia Minor, and we're going to get into to all these churches, uh, I think, in chapter 2, uh, which at this rate we, we will probably be uh, about mid-February or something like that. But John had already made it clear to you and I that anyone can read 
and profit from this book. And so it's written to seven churches, but I guarantee you uh, it's written to Calvary Chapel Somerville this morning. Um, and, and anyone who reads it, anyone who hears it, receives it, keeps it, can be blessed. In fact, there are seven Beatitudes, if you will, in the book of Revelation. Here, chapter 1, verse 3, uh, chapter 14, verse 13, chapter 16, verse 15, chapter 19, verse 9, chapter 20, verse 6, chapter 22, verse 7, and chapter 22, verse 14. There's seven places where God pronounces blessings upon his church, upon his people. And, and seven, by the way, going forward is, is going to be an important and significant number uh, in this book. Here we have seven letters to seven churches. We'll see seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, seven stars, seven lampstands, and, and even more. Uh, and of course, the number seven is the number that represents the nature of God. It, it signifies fullness and completeness signifies perfection. And he, John, begins here, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. He's talking about God the Father, the the ancient of days, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. So grace to you from God the Father and from the Holy Spirit. And you might say, well, is the Holy Spirit seven? Is there seven Holy Spirits? No, there's not seven Holy Spirits. That's not what he's saying. He is simply referencing here the Holy Spirit in his completeness, in his uh, perfection. This this is a reverence. uh, It it, it refers to uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, where we find these uh, seven characteristics of the Spirit. It says, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest Upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Seven characteristics of the Holy Spirit. So one spirit who is uh, characteristically sevenfold. So grace and peace from the Father, from the Holy Spirit, verse 5, and from Jesus Christ. Have you ever wondered if the writers of the Bible knew at the time that they were writing, that they were writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? John did. John's letting us know uh, right here that he is not the author, that he is just uh, the messenger. And so, uh, he's got a message for these churches. He's got a message for you and I. And, And he says, by the way, God the Father... God the Son and God the Holy Spirit says hi. He greets you. Grace and peace from God the Father, the Spirit, and from Jesus Christ. And he goes on to describe Jesus, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. And so here we are given the triune office of the Son, the triune office of Jesus, the faithful witness, prophet. The first to rise from the dead, priest, the ruler of the kings of the world, king. He is uh, our prophet, priest, and king. And, and, And what we need to understand here going forward is of the three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, the book of Revelation is dedicated to Jesus Christ alone. Dedicated to him alone. Why? Because of what he did for you. And for me, what he did for his people on the cross. And John continues, to him, to Jesus who loved us, which parallels John's gospel, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, which is the emphasis in John's three epistles. But notice here that he loved us first, and then he washed us. He's talking in... In first service, I said, could you imagine if one of your kids, like you got a six-year-old and he's been out playing in a mud puddle and he comes tracking in mud and you look at you look at him and you say, you're so dirty, I hate you. In order for me to love you, you need to get in the shower. <laughs> he didn't need to wash us in order to love us. He loved us when we were dirty. 
And he loved us enough to cleanse us, even though that cleansing required his own blood. The cross, you've heard me say before, is the ultimate proof of Jesus' love for you and for me. Jesus can confirm his love for you in in many, many ways, and he does. But he can offer you no greater proof than the cross. He loved us and he washed us from our sins in his own blood. And then the grand climax in verse 6, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. Before the book of Revelation has ended, Jesus will take dominion over every earthly king. And Paul wrote to Timothy that those of us who endure will rule and reign with Christ. He has made us kings. We are a people of privilege. We've been given authority. We are kings. We are royalty. He has made us priests. God called Israel to be a nation of priests, but they failed and their kingdom was taken away. So today God has given the priesthood to the people of his church. You and I, we have been given the glorious honor of representing God to man and man to God. We have access to the Holy of Holies. We have access to the presence. We have access to the throne of God Almighty. In the Old Testament, it was forbidden to combine the office of, uh, of king and, and priest. If you remember, uh, King Uzziah tried to go in and tried to make sacrifice, tried to burn incense in the temple, and he was stricken with leprosy for the rest of his life. But under the new covenant, the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ, Us being washed in his blood has made us like him in that we now have the honor of holding both offices of priest and king. And John says to him, be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so John here just gives praise where praise is due after all that Jesus has done for us. Shouldn't we praise him, guys? I mean, I know that people come to church in different moods and, you know, I I get it. What What I don't understand, I hope I don't offend anyone, but what I don't understand is during worship when I look out and I see this. Shouldn't, after what he has done for us, shouldn't we have a heart of praise? Isn't that the least that we could do? John says, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. When John says that, or when you and I say that, we're not giving him, we're not granting him dominion. We're not granting him honor. We're not granting him giving him glory, we're just acknowledging that he already has it. We're just saying amen. That's why John said amen. And now John is going to move from praising Jesus to describing his return. He says in verse 7, Behold, this is a, a command to look, to be aware Behold, he is coming with the clouds. He ascended into the clouds when he left the church. And and they were told in the book of Acts that he would so come in like manner as they saw him go into heaven. And so he will come in the clouds, but he will come in the clouds both literally and thank God figuratively because the book of Hebrews chapter 12 refers to you and I, refers to the church as this cloud of witnesses returning with Christ. And so he returns with the clouds. He returns with this multitude of believers. That gets me excited. I get excited. I was working over the building with Kelly. He goes, when you get excited, when you preach, you do this little thing. 
I said, what thing? And he goes, you, you, you kind of do this. <laughs> Did I do that just now? I don't know. I have to. I'm like, what am I, Pastor Chubby Checker over here? I get excited. <laughs> I'm going to rule and reign with Christ. That he's going to return in victory. He's going to return this conquering king and I'm going to be with them. And it says here, and every eye will see him. It won't be a secret. This isn't when Jesus comes to rapture the church, which is described as him coming as a thief in the night. And only those who are born again will see him. This is the second coming. Now, in the, in the gospel of Mark, as we were studying, Jesus first coming was kind of obscure it, knowledge of him was limited to uh, a small portion of the middle east but his second coming which is we're going to see in this book is is the, the the climax is the grand climax of this great tribulation period and his second coming is going to be this worldwide event it's going to be something that's going to be witnessed over all the earth. Again, think about trying to see the, this, this prophecy right here. Every eye will see when you lived in, in, in the early 1900s before television or internet or any of this stuff was invented. And they go, how can that happen? How can this, we can't take this literally. How can every eye see? Well, today, we see how that can happen. Fulfillment of prophecy. Every eye will see. The cults teach that or, or some of them, the Jehovah's Witness, they, they teach that Jesus has already returned in secret. But remember, Jesus said in, in Matthew 24, verses 26 and 27, Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. It will be a worldwide colossal event. Don't let anyone tell you that Jesus has returned and somehow you didn't know about it. If you haven't seen it for yourself, it ain't true. Every eye will see. Uh, I wrote a song about this when I was like 19 years old. And, and, and this, this verse right here just absolutely blew my mind. It, God just gave me this vision of a person who had been blind their whole life. Born blind, never seen anything. And this person who's, who, who, who has been blind their entire life, the first thing that they will lay eyes on is Jesus Christ. This worldwide colossal event. Every eye will see it. It says, even they who pierced him. This is in reference to the Jews. Now, by that time, the Jews as a nation will have already accepted Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Uh, but when they see his nail-scarred hands and when they see the scars in his feet, it will be a painful reminder of their rejection of him, but not for me. It will be a powerful reminder, the scars in his hands, the scars in his feet will be a powerful reminder of just how much he loves me. I think those scars are a great reminder to him of how much he loves his people. There was a woman who had her arms severely burned in a fire and from her wrist all the way down to her elbows and both of her arms she had these horrible horrible scars and everywhere she would go it would uh, uh, people would look and stare and they would point and it would attract a lot of attention but she didn't care she wore it like a badge of honor but she had a teenage daughter who was embarrassed to be seen with her mother because it got so much attention. And she would say to her mom, 
Why don't you wear long sleeve shirts? Why don't you cover up those awful scars? And mom said, because it reminds me of someone that I love dearly. It allows me to show the world how much I love this person. And the daughter, finally, she couldn't take it anymore. She goes, Mom, could you just tell me, how did you get those ugly scars in the first place? And she said, well, when you were an infant, and you were in your crib, we were asleep at night, and there was a a house fire. And the first thing I thought when I woke up, when I was woken up by the flames, is I got to get to my baby. And she said, when I came to your room, I got you out of your crib, and when when I stood up, Fire emblazed the whole room. And fire engulfed the doorway. And she said, all I could do was to wrap you. Wrap you in my arms and just go running through that fire. And I protected you. Protected you. I took these scars for you. I took this pain for you. We have to understand that these scars in Jesus' hands and these scars in Jesus' feet, he's going to take with him through all eternity. Jesus was resurrected into a glorified body. You and I will be resurrected into a glorified, perfect body. We won't have any scars. But Jesus elected to keep the scars in his hands and his feet. Because it shows the world, it shows you and I, it shows him, and it's a reminder of how much he loves us. Every person, every eye will see him, will see his face. But what we need to understand too is that every person on earth, saved or unsaved, they will see those scars as well. And it says here, and all of the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. When the Lord returns, there will be people from every tribe and every nation and every tongue that will have rejected him as Savior. And when they see him, when they see the scars in his hands, when they see the scars in his feet, they will mourn. As Jesus says in Luke's gospel, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. With that weeping, with that grinding of your teeth. Oh! You can imagine the sheer terror, the horror, when a person comes to the realization that they've gotten it all wrong. They they missed the whole purpose of life. And that was to bring glory and honor to God. And that their short time on earth was not to get all you can out of this life, but it was to establish where you were going to spend all of eternity. And you'd heard about Jesus. You'd heard about the cross. You'd heard about this free gift of salvation, but you never moved. You never accepted it. And now as you look upon the nail-scarred hands of Jesus, you realize it's too late. You missed it. The horror of realizing once and for all that you missed heaven. And not only that, that you're now going to spend all of eternity being consumed by the fires of hell, tormented day and night forever and ever. We can't imagine the fear and the terror that is going to sweep the entire world the moment that Jesus appears. And it's too late. If you haven't accepted the Lord as your personal Lord and Savior, I beg you, don't leave here today without doing so. We're going to go through this 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 book of Revelation. We're going to study all the prophetic writings. I, I, love, I love prophecy. But don't miss the point of the book. Don't miss the revelation of Jesus Christ. People like to argue over things that haven't happened yet. Scripture, don't miss the point.
Uh, we're we're going to have to stop right here <laughs> and finish up the rest of chapter 1 next week. But before we go, again, I want to emphasize that it's it's fun to study prophecy. I love it. it it's, it's exciting. It's encouraging. It's how God reveals to us His uh, sovereignty and His omniscience. All-powerful. All-knowing. But the Lord did not send this book to these various assemblies. He did not send this book to you and I simply to satisfy our curiosity of the future. The whole theme, the whole purpose is the glorification of Jesus Christ. And how do we glorify Christ? Not by being able to to break down and, and decipher the battle of Armageddon. We'll do that. But we glorify Christ by living lives that are set apart from the world. We're different. Striving for holiness. Striving for righteousness. And so as we continue through this book, may we heed its word. May we not leave one blessing on the table that God has in store for us. The, the, the famous line that Pastor Chuck uh, always talked about was, let's come into the fullness of God's blessing. I don't want half blessings. I don't want you to have half blessings. I want the fullness. I want everything that God has in store for me, for my family, for our church, for our city, our community, our country. As James says, let's not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Let's treasure it. May God's word become more precious to you than gold. Let it sift you like wheat, that we may be refined, that we may be molded into the image of God. Again, we'll finish up chapter 1 next week. Read, uh, go ahead and read forward on that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father... Oh, we thank you, God, for the revelation of your word. We pray, God, as we go forward through this book, God, that you would uh, just put on our hearts, Lord, the desire to know you more, the desire for holiness and righteousness, the desire, Father, to be that shining bright light, that bright reality to the world. City on a hill can't be hidden. That, God, that you would cleanse us, that you would... Give us the ability, Lord, to live above reproach, to live in the Spirit, and that the Spirit might have dominion over our flesh. Bless our week, Lord. It's coming to this busy season, and Lord, help us to Focus on you and your word and the reason you came in the first place. Help us to live lives that are looking, beholding as you have ordered us, Lord. We are aware that you're coming soon. A life that is lived with the knowledge of your imminent return, is a life that's lived righteously. We love you, Lord. We praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's how you change the world. Thank you for listening to Change the World with Pastor Vic Carroll from Calvary Somerville. It is our hope that this message will help you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ.